Assessment. We are pleased to welcome Professor Bakti Stepan Onggo as Principal Investigator of Relief of the Escape from the University of Southampton. So for this third session of today's workshop, we will have Professor Bakti Stepan Onggo to present about simulation modeling materials. The time okay. is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, let me just try to share my screen and see how it works. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this uh, tutorial. Today, I'm going to uh, uh, give you a tutorial on agent-based simulations. And uh, my name is Stefan Ongo. There are three terminologies that I, I need to emphasize so that you can uh, you know exactly what I'm saying. When I say model, agent-based model, we are talking about the model, the one that you will develop. Yeah. So this is the one that we will develop. That is the model. When I say agent-based modeling, it means that it is about the process of developing an ABM. So the process of model, the, uh, the process of developing a model. Yeah. So that is model that agent-based modeling. Now, when I say agent-based simulation, I'm referring to the running of the model. So when I run the model, that becomes simulations. Before I run it, it's a model. Okay. Now, if I mention ABMS or agent-based modeling and simulations, now this is where I referring to the overall process of developing and using ABM in a simulation simulation study. So I hope you, that is clear. Model is the one that you develop, is static. Simulation is the one that you run. So that when you run the model, it becomes simulations. And I'm talking about modeling and simulations. I'm talking about the whole process where we do a research or um, a project um, to, uh, in the real world to try to solve a problem using simulation that is called APMS. Yeah. Now there are several, before I move on to what uh, agent-based simulation is, I'd like to give you some example. So for, uh, there are quite a number of examples in the, uh, on the internet. Uh, I'll give you some, uh, I'll, I'll give you some in, in here. For example, this is the model called segregation. So let me just run it up to here. Yeah, so let me just make the screen a bit bigger so then you can see it. Now, maybe th this is a, the story is about a city. So in the city, there are gray people and green people. So gray and green represent different kinds of people. Yeah, so there are people with green color skin, for example, and people with a uh, gray color, color skin, yeah two different types of people. And the white color is empty space, so people can move there if they want to, okay? Now, the story here is that um, the, the people, they have some level of tolerance. So in this case, the, the tolerance is 50. It means that if the number of neighbors, so this person, it means everybody in the city, so every dot, every cell, represent one person in the city. So if every person in the city, um, they don't want to be a minority in their neighborhood. So 50% means as long as my neighbors, at least 50% of my neighbors, including myself, is this, is of the same color, then I don't mind. I'm happy where, where I am now. I'm not going to move. But if I'm in a minority, I, if I'm a minority in my neighborhood, so it means the color of my neighbors, uh, they are more than 50%, then I'm not happy. I'm going to move somewhere else. Now, let's imagine you have a city in which every single person in that city behaves in that way. What would you think will happen in the city? Think about that one first. Okay. Now, this is where I can run the simulation. So let's say if I run the simulations with these parameters, let's say I run it. Uh, so I hope you have ready made your guess. Yeah. So what will happen? 
The answer is, if you can see here, what do you see there? Segregations. So you can see that the city will be, they are, their way, the city will have several ghettos of people with the same color. Yeah. Is that what we want in, this, in our city? Right? So let's say, oh, sorry, uh, the, um, the parameter is, oh, sorry, in this case, the parameter is, uh, let, let's say uh, the parameter, let's make it the parameter is a bit high. It's not 0.6. Yeah, so okay, let's run it again. Let's run it again. Okay, so this is now is even, uh, we want to make it even bigger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is now 60%. So it means that I really want to be a majority in my neighborhoods, right? So it's even more extreme. Basically, I'm saying that, okay, if 60%, even, even if 50% of my neighbors and myself is of the same color, I'm still not happy. I really want to be a significant majority, 60%. So you can imagine if you run it, then probably you can guess the impact will be even worse. Right? So this is what we, we, we can tell from using these simulations. Yeah, agent-based. Yeah. Okay. Now let's change the parameter. Now, what if now uh, people in the city is quite tolerant? Let's say it is uh, let's say it's not 0.2. It means that. Uh, my tolerance level is now is 20%. So it means that as long as at least 20% of people in my neighborhood is of the same color, I don't mind. Now, this one, think carefully, what do you think would happen? This person, can you, can you see, uh, can you say this person is a racist? Yeah. Most of you probably say, no, this person is fine. It's only 20, you know, 20% is decent, isn't it? It's really well, more than decent, bro. <laughs> yeah, but let's see what is going to happen in the city if everybody behaves in that way. Yeah, so let's just run it again. Yeah, so I hope you can get the gist of what agent based simulation is by looking at this one. So I'm saying that earlier, so it's so. We are simulating the behavior of every individual in the city. But we do not know what is going to happen at the city level. We know the behavior at the, at the per person level, at the micro level, at the individual level. So what we code, what we model is individual behavior. What we want to know, what we want to uh, estimate from that is if these individuals interact, what would happen at the system level? So whenever you have that questions, oh, I know uh, the le micro level behavior. I know the individual behavior. I just want to know if these people, they interact, what would happen? Now, if you have that question straight away, you know agent-based simulation is the tool to answer that, yeah. Now look, let's look at this uh, city again, go back again to the city where now in this case, uh, people are very tolerant, yeah. So let's rerun it. You can see here, right? The city is, uh, in a way, it's a lot, be a lot better than previous one, right? But you can see here, smaller ghettos will appear as well, okay? It's not as bad as the previous one, but even, with, even in a, a city where with a high degree of tolerance, as long as you still take into account the color of your skin or your ideology, smaller ghettos will still appear which in a way i think you can see this one in our society isn't it so even though you you think you, let's say ask ourselves are we that kind of person but you know can you say that in, in your clique don't you think you are forming some kind of you know minor smaller ghettos in your life if you do it that way yeah it may happen yeah but okay so of course, this is just a toy model because in reality, it's not really easy for you to move to a, a new place, right? <laughs> you have to buy a house. You have to find a house. Your kids, they have to go to different schools. So it's important. It's, in reality, it will be more difficult. But that is not the point here. The point here is that it's really difficult for us 
as a human to understand what will happen in the system level. Even though we know the individual behavior is simple, there is nothing, nothing difficult about this. But if you know programming, all that you need is just count your neighbor, right? How many of them have the same color? If they are like greater than our threshold, then I move to a new place. That is a very simple code. Maybe that's something that you can give to high school students. It's nothing difficult about that code. But what is difficult is, if I put all these individuals together in a city, what will happen to the city? Now that is a bit more difficult. Our human brain is not really trained to think in that way. Because that is easy if, the system is linear. But in this case, the system is clearly non-linear because we, there are some interactions between different people. My behavior, the, 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 uh, the behavior at the city level depends on my behavior and other people's behavior. So this is where the non-linearity uh, kicks in. Yeah, so I hope that gives you uh, motivations why we need to learn uh, agent-based simulations. Yeah, so there are many other examples that I'm not going to uh, explain now, but you can play around. So one of the most uh, uh, important at the moment is about the virus spread model. Again, you can imagine that right? uh, if you are a government or you are the public health officials, you would think, okay, suppose we have X percent of our society doesn't want to be vaccinated. And suppose we have this X percent of the people in the society, they don't want to wear masks. Suppose we have this kind of expression of people in the society, they want to spread rumors, misinformations about vaccines, about uh, or they spread rumors about certain uh, dodgy illegal drugs, for example. <laughs> um, you, if we, these people interact in the society, in a, in a country, in the regions, what would happen in terms of uh, the spread of the disease? So again, if you look at that question, straight away, right? I make a hypothesis about the behavior at the individual level. And I want to know what is the impact at the city level, region level, regional level, or at the national level. So you can see here, oh, again, I, this should, should ring a bell to you, right? Or oh, this is a question where agent-based simulation is a tool, uh, probably the best tool to answer, okay? And a lot of questions in supply chain as well, isn't it? In supply chain, suppose you know the behavior of suppliers is this way, the behavior of the focal organization is this way, the behavior of distributors is this way. You want to mix them. Okay, let's put them together in a network uh, of a supply chain. Let's see what is happen, what is going to happen to the supply chain. So again, that is a typical question that uh, can be answered using agent-based simulations. So knowing uh, what's agent-based simulation roughly now, uh, who are using it? Is it worth uh, uh, studying it? Um, my, this is uh, some uh, examples uh, given by uh, Charles Markle. Charles Markle is probably uh, what is the, the, a well-known person, uh, researchers in agent-based simulations. Yeah, so I learned a lot from him. So this is just a, a number, uh, you know, a number of examples. Uh, there are more. So I try to search it as, uh, as well in food supply chains. You can see here, there is an increasing number of publications yeah, in, in food supply chain alone. So you can see here, more and more people in uh, food supply chain, they are using agent base. Now, if I, when I'm looking at the, uh, in business and management, so we are talking about uh, just business and management applications, you can see as well, there is a similar uh, trend, an increasing trend in people using uh, ABMS, uh, in uh, business and management as well. Okay, so uh, from time to time, I will give you the uh, reference, but in this case, the reference is still not available yet because it's still in press, but when it is available, you can always Google it and this will be open access. So you can always, uh, you can get the paper later on. Similarly, this one, it, this one has been published so you can uh, get access to the paper, but if you don't have access to the paper, yeah, you can always uh, contact me, yeah. Okay, so knowing who is um, who are using it, yeah. So I hope I can convince you that this method is useful for that particular uh, questions, and then you knowing that that question is very common in many different fields. So that's why many people are using it. 
Yeah. So now let's delve into the detail. What is it? What is agent-based simulations? Okay. So agent-based model. Now I'm talking about the model. Uh, is formed by agents. Essential. It means definitely if you write an agent-based model, it must have an agent, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it will not be called agent-based model. Okay. So agent is essential, and it also has environment. In this case, it's optional. Although most of the uh, real, uh, realistic model, uh, agent-based model, uh, they have environment. Yeah, it's not, it's not really, even though it's optional, but it's getting more and more common. Yeah, only toy models probably will not have any uh, environment. Yeah. So the focus I have already explained earlier, the focus when you build a model, agent-based model, uh, is on the individual. So you are modeling individual agents, individual, uh, yeah, individual agents, and then you describe their local behavior. By I mean local, it means their own behavior. Yeah. So remember my example about the city. So it's about their behavior, whether or not they want to move or not. When do you think? When do they uh, want to move? If they are not happy, when they are not happy, or if they are a minority in their neighborhood. So that is a local rule, behave a local behavior. Yeah. So in this case, the question is really, when you want to build an agent in this model, you have to ask yourself, which agents to model? Because if you're looking at, let's say the uh, uh, epidemic, COVID-19, if you want to model COVID-19 spread in the society, do you want to model every person in Indonesia or in any country? Let's say Indonesia, do you want to represent every single in individual in Indonesia in one agent? So you will create what, 260 million agents in your model. And how do you know the behavior of each individual? It straight away think, oh, yeah, of course. Just like any other model, you need to simplify the, uh, you need to make a simplification so that your model is manageable, right? So in this case, you probably just want to represent some uh, key uh, people in, in, in the society, yeah? So that is uh, how we uh, build a model. Now, even for after you identify those people, you know, uh, which behavior that which, which behavior that is relevant in your case. So if you're talking about epidemic spread of COVID-19, uh, maybe the behavior like, I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, what food they like, who cares? Probably doesn't, ma doesn't matter, right? But behavior like how often they go out, to buy food that may be important okay how how often they uh, you know they 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 conform with the uh, protocol health protocol whether they are strict in implementing the health protocol or sometimes they don't do it so that is important behavior to uh, to capture in the model so you have to ask your questions but which behavior to model we don't want to model their behaviors from there you know the time they wake up until the time they go back to sleep it doesn't make any sense so again, we have to simplify. We have to pick the important behaviors. Now, I just mentioned that uh, uh, for human behavior or any behavior, uh, individual behavior, there are two types of behavior that we can model in agent-based model. One is the, the one that is easier to model, easier, in, yeah, uh, is external. Why? Because we can collect data, we can observe it. So for example, when someone is wearing mask or not, you can easily see them, right? If someone say uh, buying an item or not buying an item, you can see that, you can observe that, you can collect the data about that. But what you cannot collect data about is the changes, internal changes inside the person. Say the person is getting happier and happier. Maybe you can tell from the smile, but in general, you can't, right? Uh, changes in behavior that the person is getting less, uh, they, they lose trust to the government over time. That is really difficult to observe, right? Because it's happening internally. So that is something, or someone is getting stronger uh, belief in certain uh, ideology, for example, that is really difficult to, uh, to, uh, to, to observe. So in this case, you need a different kind of methods to uh, extract the data, yeah? So that is called internal behavior. So there are two types of behavior, internal and external. Externals typically is easier to collect because you can observe them. Internal typically is more difficult to collect because you have to ask that person, yeah. Okay, 
So that is agent-based model. Now, sometimes we also need to model the behavior of environment to represent changing environment. Yeah. So for example, say for example, um, in the it uh, in the uh, let's say COVID nineteen for example, the uh, things that we can uh, model uh, as a changing environment is uh, the variant of the virus for example, with the uh, you inject new variants from time to time in the model, yeah. So that is the changing in the environment. So so we can model that one as well. Yeah, the decision makers, the individuals, in or the agents in the model will be people. But the environment in this case will be the uh, the virus, or changing environment can be new medicines, new vaccines. So you can always include that in the model. I hope that is clear what each of this model is. Yeah. So uh, just to uh, make it a bit more clearer now, uh, agents uh, can be people, which is very easy, very straightforward. So agents basically do uh, in in agent based modeling context. Agents are people or individuals who make decisions yeah, in the system. Yeah. In this case, people, they make decisions. Customers, they make decisions. Patients, they make decisions. Refugees, volunteers, farmers. Yeah. And also living things, they can make decisions. Yeah. In the context of modeling, yeah. uh, for example, we can uh, model trees. And trees make decisions whether they want to grow or not. Whether they want to die or not, for example, yeah, or crops, cattle, fish, bacteria, uh, cattle, uh, bacteria, for example, whether they want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, they they want to spread. So maybe the movement. So basically, uh, we we model living things uh, as if they can make decisions and they have their own behavior. Even non-living things can be an agent as well. So for example, if we want to simulate uh, drones, how they operate. We want to simulate how robots interact with each other, vehicles, especially for example, in, with smart vehicles. Uh, so when they can communicate with other vehicles, how do they uh, coordinate in reality? Uh, warehouses, say so like food, uh, medical supplies. Those are non-living things that we can also model as agents. Yeah. Uh, of course, depends on the context. It doesn't mean that oh, whenever I see food, it's always an agent. No, it depends on the context. We are talking about. Uh, con consumer behavior, food in here is not agents, it's human that makes decision about whether or not to eat the food or not. Right? <laughs> so it's the other way around. Okay. Um, Non-material things like ideas, knowledge, projects, that can be uh, modeled as agents because uh, say for example, a ideas can change, for example, knowledge can change. Yeah. Organizations definitely can be implemented as agents, how organizations uh, behave. Yeah, so that's why there is a field called organizational behavior, for example, organizational study, because then we want to study the behavior the, uh, of organizations. So that's why we can also implement organizations as agents. Now, just to give you an example, this is in my study with uh, Dana, my ex PhD students, is uh, now uh, working at Harriet Watt. Um, Agents in food supply chain, just to give an example, when I we, we review a literature on food supply chains and we found uh, a lot of models, the, the typical agents in the food supply chain is producer, post harvest, uh, processor, retailer, consumer, as something as, as you might expect, right, in the food supply chain. And uh, clearly many of them focus on farmer, farmers, yeah, producers are farmers in this case in food supply chains. So just to give you a real world example of what people use in the, as agents in their model. Now, if you're talking about agent-based modeling, then it's, it is, um, I think it's good to, uh, to talk about uh, emergent behavior. Yeah. So emergent behavior, as I mentioned earlier, is the patterns at the population level. So the behavior at the population level that is not explicitly programmed. So if you write an HBDS model, but you specify the behavior at the population level, you make a big mistake, a grave mistake, yeah. So that is the, uh, the biggest mistake in HBDS modeling. When you build an HBDS modeling, what you specify is only individual behavior, the, individ the behavior of the agents, not the system, okay. But the pattern at the population, the, pop uh, the uh, behavior at the population has to be, has to emerge from the interactions between individuals. 
For example, in the city uh, example that I gave you earlier, I didn't write code about segregation. No, right? What we write code is about whether people are happy or not in their neighborhood. So individual behavior that we, uh, that we put into the model, not the system, not the city level behavior. The segregation is a consequence of the interactions between people in the city. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, so it's a, it's a collective behavior basically that we want to predict. Yeah, now this kind of uh, behavior makes predictions more challenging because then uh, the perform uh, the the behavior at the system level it depends on the interactions between uh, people between individuals at the lower level. Now that is really difficult to uh, to uh, to predict. Yeah. So that's why most analytics techniques are probably not suitable to analyze this kind of problem. Um, they can, uh, typically they simplify it as a black box. So you assume, okay, because we, do not, we don't know what the local, be, uh, the individual behavior is, then we just put them as a black box. So you change the input and then see what the output might be. Yeah, so, uh, uh, but you do not know what drives the behavior inside the black box. Yeah, so that makes it, difficult, especially if you want to design uh, policy interventions. Because if you do a policy intervention, you really want to know which behavior to target, which behavior that I want to promote, which behavior that I want to prevent, yeah, or I want to control. So that is, uh, so that's why agent-based modeling in this case is uh, appropriate. So example of emergent behavior uh, in nature is like flocking of birds, you know, birds when they fly together, it, it, it forms a very beautiful patterns, but they don't really, uh, you know, arrange that. They really just follow simple rules, neighbor, very local rules. So uh, that is uh, also in nature. In social system, it's a uh, market crashes. That is also, uh, it's not design, right? It's because of the interactions of the individuals in the system. And because the system itself has some vulnerabilities, so then market can crash. Get those the one that you uh, we have that we have seen. Uh, uh, wealth distributions. Why only a minority of people are very rich, but the rest are. So the the, the curve is what we see quite commonly in the in a society. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Traffic jam is an emergent behavior, right? We don't um, you know you know in a way we don't create the traffic jam, uh, but it is because of the individual driver's decisions and the individual road user decisions that makes traffic jams. Yeah, so because they say, for example, they want to go out at the same time, for example, and so on and so forth. Okay, right. So that is basically uh, a brief uh, introduction to what agent-based modeling is. I hope that is clear to everyone here, yeah. So uh, let me just check. There is a, a few uh, in the chat. Okay, okay. There is no question. So good. In that case, then let, let me move on to the modeling now. This is about how to build a model in uh, agent based using agent based simulations. Okay. Right. So now I want to explain about the uh, how if you want to build a simulation. So this is not just agent based simulation, but any simulation. Yeah. Our typical starting point is always real world problem, right? We have a real world problem. If you don't have any problem, then let's move on. Yeah, there is nothing to solve. But in this case, we have a real world problem. So because of that, we build a conceptual model. Conceptual model is basically uh, a model that is, it's kind of a, a design of a model, yeah. So this is where, if I'm an agent-based modeler, then in conceptual model, I'm identifying the agents. Who are the agents? What kind of behaviors that I want to capture? What, what is the interaction between agents? So that is happening in the conceptual modeling. So when I build a conceptual model, I have already got the design of my model. So what are the agents? What are, be, what are the behaviors that I want to implement? What is the environment? Um, and yeah, basically the components of the model. What is the scope of my model? 
which agents that I need to include, which agents that I, I don't have to model, I can exclude them, which behavior that I want to include, those are in the conceptual model. Yeah. So basically the design of a model eh, to make it simpler. Okay. Now the process of building that is called conceptual modeling. And then after that, from conceptual model, once you have the design, then it's a matter of implementing it using a uh, software tool. So in today's tutorial, I'm going to use um, the, agent, uh, the tool um, that I'm going to use is um, Agent Pi. Yeah, but of course there are many other tools that you can use. So that is about model coding, how to implement your ideas into a tool. So when you learn the tool, you are learning how to implement your idea, right? But the tool doesn't help you with the idea. So that's why the idea is really important because this is where your skill as a modeler is needed. The tool will not help you with that. The tool only helps you to implement, to realize your idea, make it uh, tangible in a computer model so that you can run it in using experiments. So by running your model a few times in an experiment, then you build under you will build an understanding about what the problem is and how to solve it, yeah? So that is where we do experiments. What it, so here we, we ask questions like, in the COVID-19 case, for example, we ask questions, what if we do this um, uh, vaccination strategy? What if we do this uh, social media campaign? What if not? So that kind of question, so it means we change some of the parameters in the model and then see how it affects uh, the uh, the system that we are trying to manage here. Yeah, so that what we call solutions. Once we have a better understanding of the solutions, uh, just remember that solution is based on a model. So it's still on computer. So you still need to think about how to implement it back into the real world. So according to the model, this is the best solution, for example. A is the best solutions. But then when you want to implement A in the real world, of course, you need to think of a lot of uh, issues here. Yeah? how we can uh, implement A in the real world. This is where you need to talk to the, say, social scientists, to the behavioral scientists. You need to talk to uh, a lot of people to say, hey, will it work? And how to make sure this is works in the society. So that is uh, this link. Yeah. Now, in every, in every step, so for example, like conceptual modeling, then there is a kind of validations we try to come uh, check whether the conceptual model is the right conceptual model for the problem at hand. Likewise, after you have your design, whether your computer model is will be verified against the conceptual model. Is this the right computer model that implements your design? Yeah. So likewise, this was the after you do the experimentation, you just need to you need to double check whether this is the right experiments. Uh, for us and so on and so forth. And then one more comparison that is quite important is what we call validations. So this is where we compare real world problem, uh, the real world and the computer model. Whether or not the computer model represents the real world. Yeah, accurately. So whether the computer model represents the real world accurately. So that is the call, what we call validations. Yeah, because say for example, we do experiments using a computer model. So it means that the computer model should somehow be accurate enough to represent the real world. We know that the computer model will be a simplification. It will never represent the real world 100% correctly. Of course, it's impossible. But what we want is, can this computer model be used for our purpose to do experiments? Is, does it capture the, the most important points or parts in the, sim, uh, in the real world? As long as we are uh, we can that, uh, we can establish that that this model is a good representative of the real world then we can use it for decision making yeah so let's look at the real world problem real world problem has many points of view yeah i i think you agree with me right let's just say example like um i don't know um a lockdown if i say lockdown do you agree or not or disagree? Just true or false? Even that, this uh, the number of people uh, participant here probably will be split into two, right? Those who agree, who does don't agree. That's represent different perspective. We look at we look at problems in from different perspectives, and that is very natural in the real world. 
in, in a complex system. Yeah. And then problem is messy. That's true, isn't it? Lockdown is not as simple as just blocking down of the society. No, it is really a, a, a messy problem because you have to talk about education. You have to talk about public health. You have to talk about economic. You have to talk about uh, you know, mental health. So they are interrelated. There is no one correct answer to this, right? So it's really difficult. It's about a balancing. Uh, that is really the, 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 and also there is an ambiguity and disagreement, for example, in the real world. So there is sometimes we ask, what do you mean? Uh, uh, when do you think we should open up the lockdown? What is the criteria? So, uh, the, and also uncertainty. Real world problems quite, is quite often is uncertain. There are a lot of factors that we don't understand or we don't have the data. So then we, you know, we have to guess. Yeah. And then real world problem is always changing. Yeah, partly because it's the problem is caused by human behavior and human, be, human behavior keeps changing. So that is also uh, an issue, okay? So basically in short, real world problem is a messy problem. So that's why we need a tool to help us deal with this messy problem. So you, from, from me, I always think simulation as a tool of to aid my thinking, to structure my thinking, so, and also to help me make decisions, yeah? So, uh, so the key word here is that uh, simulation is a tool for me to increase my understanding about the problem. So that is uh, why simulation is quite an important tool because it really helps me to think about the problem. It may not give me the solution that I want, yeah, but it gives me a, a, a better understanding about the problem. So then I can make better decisions. So that is the key point here. Yeah, simulation will not probably give you the, the best answer, but simulation will help you to understand the system better. And that is what is important for us as human, right? then we can make better decisions with this tool. So I hope that makes sense to you. So that is what I mean by uh, a tool to uh, help us thinking and also make decisions. Okay, I already mentioned about conceptual model. Now I just give you a bit more detail what conceptual model is. Basically, it's a non-software specific descriptions of a computer simulation model, yeah, from which model can be built. I think you roughly can get, uh, understand this already. So non-software specific, it means that when you build, uh, you, when you design a model, you should not think about, this should not be uh, specific to a certain software that we are going to use. This is really, we are talking about in agent-based modeling, we are talking about who are the agents. You, we are, you think in terms of agents, you are not thinking about, okay, since the software that I'm going to use is, let's say, any logic, I need to find what, what, what is the uh, you know, specific detail of the, uh, the software that I'm going to include in the model. No, you need to, uh, because uh, in the conceptual model, really think about the, uh, uh, at the conceptual level. So you really think about nothing to do with the software. It's about the model itself, the agent-based model. Yeah, agent-based model is, has nothing to do with the software. The software is only help us to build an agent-based model, okay? So in this case, as I said, in the conceptual model, basically you build the components of the agents. Um, uh, you draw, basically, you, you design you know, uh, the, the components of the model. So it depends on the objective of the model. What is the objective of the model? What should be the input of the outputs of the model? Yeah, so you have to design it very early on. What kind of outputs that you want to get from the model? So then we are talking about the content of the model, the scope, which agents to include, which behavior to include. So that is about talking about the scope. And then we're also talking about the level of details. So the level of details we are talking about, so okay, so uh, what level of agents that we want to implement? Should I implement every individual in an in organization or in a city? Or can I move on a bit? Okay, maybe a group of people. Or maybe can I impl implement it at the, I don't know, district level? Or is it city level? So that is the level of detail. So yeah, the level of detail that we want to include in the model. Then of course, we need to specify what assumptions that we make, what simplifications that we make, yeah. Uh, assumption is because we don't have the data, so we have to assume. So then in this case, we have to record what, what our assumptions are, yeah? Because different assumptions may, may lead to different results. So it is important for you to write down the assumptions. So whoever make decision based on that model, they are aware of your assumptions, yeah? 
And simplification is different. Simplification is basically saying that, wow, these things is too complex to model. So I try to make it simple. Yeah, I can, I, I try to make it simpler. So that's why I remove the, uh, uh, this complexity. Say for example, in the real world, we have, let's say, uh, 10 different agents, 10 different agent types. Okay, that is too complex to model all 10, for example. Let's focus on who are the, you know, if 70% of the uh, decisions are made by 30% of the agents, then maybe just model the three agents who make the 70% decisions. So we ignore the rest. So that is basically a one of the simplification that we can use, yeah. Okay, now let's, I think it's time to uh, probably take a short break, five minutes, yeah. So when I come back, I'm going to explain to you one by one here, the objectives, input, outputs, content, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think it's time, uh, maybe it's good time to stretch our legs because otherwise you will be sitting all the time, yeah. So it's, it's, let's have a five minutes break, really five minutes, a sweet short break, and then come back again. So my time here is 29 pass, so let's make it 30 pass. We come back at 35 plus, yeah, okay? Okay, let's come back in five minutes. Okay, um, it's already 35 past uh, the hour. So let, let us go back to conceptual model again. So before the break, I mentioned that a conceptual model, uh, in this case, we develop the components of the model. So this is the design. Uh, to me, uh, this is the most, probably the most important step in our modeling because this is where we design the model, yeah. So the first thing that we need to design here, we need to understand is the objective of the model. So because everything that we do uh, from, the, uh, from the next step onwards is everything depends on the objective. If you get the objective right, then it's, in, it's good. But if you get the objective wrong, then you will waste your time and effort trying to solve a wrong thing which is, not, you know, it's not in the best interest of anyone, okay? So that's why we need to get the, uh, the objective right. That is really critical in any modeling work, not just agent-based model, any modeling work. In fact, anything in the world, right? You need to get your objective right first. <laughs> okay, let's say, uh, based on my uh, uh, experience, yeah, uh, reading a lot of papers on agent-based simulations, uh, I can basically uh, categorize uh, the usage of agent-based simulations in two categories. The first category, uh, what I call from known micro to research the unknown macro. So here, the starting point is assuming we know the individual behavior, we want to know what would happen at the system level. So this is a clear... the. So the, the example that I gave you earlier, the city example, is a clearly a good example of this, right? So we, we assume, in this case, the assumption is we know what the individual behaviors are, yeah, at the individual level. So that can be a driver's behavior at the individual level. It can be, uh, it's to answer a question from uh, Blue Herawati. So for example, yes, we can implement a individual driver behavior. We can implement individual people uh, during COVID-19, for example, right? So assuming we know, well, it doesn't matter whether we know or not, but assume we know, yeah? So uh, we assume that this is the behavior. And then what we want to know, if these people interact in the system, what would happen to the system at the system level? Now, that is uh, what I mean by known micro to research unknown macro, yeah? So, in, on your screen here, I just give you a, an example. If I know this behavior of the supplier this way, and manufacturer will behave in this way, distributor will behave in this way, and retailer will behave in this way, and shopper will behave in this way, what would happen at the supply chain level? Yeah. So the behavior somehow can be uh, managed, can be uh, assumed to be uh, set at this, they do certain behavior. We can assume it from either from contract, because they are bound by contract, yeah, 
or that can be bound by norm in the society. It can be bound by something. So sometimes it is reasonable to assume that we know the behavior based on contract, based on norm, based on, based on culture, based on, uh, well, it, it depend what, what is applicable in your field, yeah. Now, the second types of uh, ABS usage is the other way around. So basically, we want to research the unknown micro to explain the known macro. So in this case, the starting point is the macro level behavior. We notice something happens at the macro level, at the system level, and we want to pin down, we want to know what causes this, what can explain this behavior. Yeah. So we, I haven't given you the example of this. So for example, if you want to know, uh, I think uh, for those who study supply chains, so we want to know, oh, there is this uh, a bull whip effect behavior, for example, yeah. Uh, we want to know uh, which behavior at the uh, supply chain level that explains that bull whip effect. Yeah, of course, those who study uh, bull, uh, supply chain will know what causes it, right? So uh, in this case, the delay in, in information, for example. But that is uh, one of examples why, if I know um, the behavior of the macro level, we want to know what what behavior at the individual level that might explain, that could explain uh, the phenomena that we see at the system level, yeah. So let me just give you an example. This is a, a, an example of the first one. Uh, I, I already give you the example of the city earlier, but let me just give you another example that I used when I uh, did a training to the Malaysian uh, uh, public health people. So this is, a, we are, let's say this is, a, I think most of you know that this is Malaysia. So in this case, then let's assume every individual behave in certain way. Yeah. So individual will move from susceptible, infected and recover, for example, and then they interact in certain way. And then we can, you know, once we assume those people behave in a certain way, we want to put them together in the system and then simulate them what would happen to the uh, spread of infections in the, in the country. So that is what we call uh, non-micro because we assume we know the behavior of the people to research the unknown macro. The unknown, unknown macro is about the spread of the disease. Yeah. So in this case, we do not know what will happen to the mark at the macro level if people behave in certain way. Yeah. I hope that that is clear for, uh, to you, right? Because this is what if question, right? In this case, what if 100% of people or 90% of people, they, they are wearing masks in public uh, places, but 10% will not wear masks. Uh, in reality, probably we, uh, you know, so this is what, what we call what if questions. And then if we do this one, we spread, oh, okay, the behavior will be this way. So what can, what happen if instead of 90, 10, uh, in, this one is 70, 30, 70% wearing mask, what will happen to the spread of disease now? That is kind of what if question that we can uh, explore here. So this is uh, an example of known micro to research the unknown macro. So let me give the example of the opposite. Uh, this is from my research with Dana, uh, my uh, ex PhD students. So we are researching about um, uh, daily supply chains and in West Java. So I think uh, this is, uh, I think uh, for those who are in Indonesia or maybe in, 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 in other countries, they are quite familiar with the fact that uh, uh, most of the farmers are small holding farmers, yeah. So they basically live with their own cattle, right? So this is the, the back, uh, this is the house of the farmer. And then behind the house is where the pen is, where the cattle, uh, when the cow uh, lives, yeah. Uh, because, uh, because usually if they are in the residential area, there is no way for them to walk their cattle to go uh, for forage to, uh, you know, to get food. Instead, it is the, the, the farmers who will bring the food to the cattle, right? To the cows. So I think this, this uh, uh, scene is quite familiar to most of us here. I need to explain a bit uh, more detail if I explain this one to my colleagues in the UK, for example, because it's not, it's not useful in the UK, but it is very useful in Indonesia. So that is uh, what happened in Indonesia. Now, in the, in the context of this one, we know at the macro level, we know there is a decrease, decline in milk production in West Java between 2011 and 2015. So this is where we know uh, why I call explain known macro because we know this one from data. We know that at the macro level, this is what happens. What we do not know 
what we want to research into is what is the individual behavior that can explain this phenomena at the system level. I hope it's clear. So that is a different question, isn't it? So I know what happened at the system level. I want to know what might explain this phenomenon at the system level uh, at the individual level. So that's why uh, Dan, and, Dan and, uh, and I try to uh, then collect some data and then uh, collect some data and then uh, implement those uh, behavior. You, uh, you, you're not supposed to see this one because you can always read the, the paper. So we, we, we uh, basically implement those behaviors in the model and then run the model now after we collect data from, uh, from the farmers, and then we implement this behavior from the data uh, into our model, and then we run the model, and then voila, we can produce something like this. So in this case, we can uh, confident, we are a bit, we are in a way is confident that our uh, model can uh, reproduce what happens in the real world, yeah? Now, this is the where we have to be careful. This method is using abductive logic. Abductive logic, yeah? Uh, so it's not deductive. So what we can, act, so our conclusions is that this behavior, the one that we put in, in the model, is one of the possible explanations of the decline of meat production in West Java. We cannot say this is definitely 100% sure is the cause of the milk uh, decline in the milk production. That would be wrong conclusions. Yeah, because we are not using deductive here. We are using abductive. So the quality of uh, our answer here, our conclusion, it depends on how good we are in understanding about the system. So this is where, you know, uh, expertise in agriculture, people who knows the uh, farmers behavior, sociologists, ethnographers, they will have a key role in, the, in building the credibility of the model because then can we, is this really what happened in the real, uh, in the real world? Is this what happening in the farm? Can, does this make sense? So if you know better about the field, then of course your explanation will be stronger, right? So it means even though we are using abductive logic, we know that this is very likely to be the cause, the one that can explain why there is a decline in the milk productions. But of course, scientifically speaking, we know that we cannot prove it 100%. It is just one of the possible explanations. This is different from this one. This side, the non-micro to research and non-micro is deductive. So your conclusion will be stronger because we know that assuming people behave in this way and if they interact, then this is what will happen in the, in the real world. You run it multiple times, it will produce exactly the same result. People from different parts of the world, they will run this one, they will get the same results, yeah. So this is uh, basically following the dedu deductive logic, yeah. Of course, this deductive logic can fall, uh, can be broken if your assumptions turns out to be incorrect. So in this case, if you use the first uh, approach, then you need to make sure your assumptions are justifiable. So the foundations is in your assumptions and of course I assume that your model is correct right <laughs> if your model isn't correct of course it's still incorrect yeah uh, but for the second approach it's really you cannot really make uh, an assumptions uh, just like when you apply deductive logic this is abductive logic so you have to uh, the best that you can say is, is one of the possible explanations now whether that is the strongest explanations it depends on how good you are uh, in understanding the problem, yeah, the, the domain problem, yeah. So, for example, if I have to explain that one, I'm not an expert in agriculture, so I cannot probably explain that. So that's why I need to collaborate with my colleagues from the uh, from Pajajaran, who is an expert in uh, understanding cow's behavior. <laughs> Sorry, farmer's behavior, <laughs> not cow behavior, not the cow's behavior. <laughs> Okay, so, but that is, I hope that you get the idea, the difference between this research and the previous one, okay? Yeah, so this is why interdisciplinary research is very important, yeah. Now, the next component is input-output. I think this is the easiest, basically, we are talking about. So, if, if the objective is try to understand, uh, you know, uh, a waiting time, for example, in a hospital, then what is the uh, output of the, uh, of the, uh, 
of the hospital uh, of the model. Of course, it's the in this case the waiting time, right? So this is just an example for you to uh, how to uh, structure uh, your input and output. So in this case, I just want to say that the performance of the system. This is the output of the model will produce performance of the system, and then the performance of the system is calculated using two variables: staff utilization and patients. Uh, total ta time target, this is the probably the waiting time, yeah, or the response time and the utilizations. And then to calculate utilization, it means the model needs uh, an input of the number of doctors, number of nurses, number of clerks. And to calculate staff utilization and patient total target time, we also need the input about the patient's arrival, uh, patient profile, basically, the, the arrival times as well as their severity level. So in this case, we know that which input will affect which outputs. Yeah. So the main output of the simulation will be this one. So this is just a, a, a drawing, a diagram that can help you structure your thinking about uh, which input uh, will affect which output. Yeah. So it's just a, it's kind of a tool that you can use uh, to structure your thinking. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just an example from, um, again, my research with Danan, uh, some of the example of input output in the, that is commonly used in food supply chains. So the input data uh, typically, uh, sorry, the output, the output data typically is a production measures. So how many uh, tons of crops produced, for example, that is production measure. Uh, financial measure, typically profit or cost, yeah. So that is, what is the total cost? What is the total profit? And final measures is, for example, like the pollutions. Yeah. Uh, so there is the pollutions, trust and relationship among agents. Uh, so this is a, uh, the, the output will be trust level between agents. Yeah. Uh, trust is something that is, in, uh, again, is intrinsic, right? So internal behavior. So this is a bit tricky to model because you cannot observe trust. Uh, let's say if I trust, I say I trust Pat Tommy, for example. <laughs> Uh, how do you measure that? <laughs> and how do you know that I'm not lying? <laughs> so it's a bit tricky. Okay. Uh, and quality and safety. Okay. And this is a safer some number of accidents. Uh, that is a, uh, some of the uh, output data. Yeah. The input uh, typically they can uh, use for survey, interview, uh, participatory modeling, or most of them we use secondary data. Uh, say, for example, from uh, uh, Office of National Statistics, for example, they produce a lot of data uh, annually, so you can always use that data. Okay, now the next uh, component in the model is the uh, the design of the model itself. So in this case, uh, we design, uh, let's say in this example, I show you uh, the, our model comprises four different types of agents, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Um, these agents, A1, A2, A, and A3, A4, lives in a grid. Yeah, A1 and A2, they live in the same cell. A4 lives in a different cell. A3 lives in a different cell, but this cell is empty. The top right corner cell is empty. Nobody lives there. So grid can represent spatial uh, environment, yeah, where people live, for example. Yeah, try to simplify the system. And... The agents also, for the same model, we can also define their uh, communication network. So for example, in this case, A1 talks to A3, but A3 doesn't talk to A1. So A1 uh, doesn't talk to But A2 talks to A1, for example. Yeah, so it's just give you some uh, toy example. Basically, uh, we can, for, what we can learn from here is that a model, agent-based model, is formed by a number of agents, and these agents can live in different layer of in, uh, environment. In this case, I show you the first layer is a spatial layer where people live, where people live. In this case, we, we simplify the city or the real world as grids, and we can also define their relationship by uh, specifying the network between agents. So it, it is possible to have multiple layer of networks, uh, multiple layer of environments in an agent-based model. So that is the key take uh, away from this slide. Just to give you an example in the real world, this is uh, again from the same research. Uh, in supply chain, food supply chains, uh, the agents, I think I have already mentioned to you, typically is producer, post processor, liter, uh, re retailer, consumer, and other. So these are typical agents that people use in food supply chains, yeah. So just to give you an example, uh, uh, 
this is a very abstract, but this is the uh, real example. Okay. So after you uh, identify the agents, then the next step will be to represent the agent's behavior. So what? Uh, so we want to know the behavior of agents. So typically, what we so this is a uh, multiple agents, but there is a say for example, this agents the behavior is represented by in this case I represented using state chart that this agent will uh, change from the state susceptible being infected becomes exposed. From exposed, they're becoming infectious, then they move to infectious states where they can uh, infect other. So in this case, from infectious, they can uh, they uh, follow the recovering process, becomes recovered, and then have immunity, and then they will become susceptible again. So this is uh, just to represent the behavior of these agents. Yeah. And there is many ways of implementing the behavior. Yeah. So uh, later we will see how it we do it in agent pi. Uh, this is uh, again a real world example from the papers published in food uh, for food supply chains. Typical behavior that people model put in the model is production planning. So production planning uh, in food supply chain is means that uh, say something uh, crop mix. So what is the proportion of my land uh, will be planted with uh, I don't know uh, corn, rice, and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, corn, rice, and so on and so forth. And production planning also scheduling about when to plant what. Uh, investment will be about the uh, you know the, the the budget, the money that we will spend on certain things, and so on and so forth. Uh, technology a choice and adoption is about whether a farmer will adopt certain technology or certain uh, uh, certain new procedure, for example, new process. Yeah, uh, that is also a typical decision. So the farmers have to make the decisions adopt or not to adopt yeah to cooperate or not to cooperate and so on and so forth so this is a uh, some of the examples in food supply chains uh okay this is the detail that i just mentioned yeah production planning investment technology technology choice and adoptions corporations product tracing of quality yeah so those are typical again the, the detail you can always find from my paper so this where in the paper i explain in in a very detail about what these decisions are okay let's move on so now remember the component of the agents one of them is sorry agent this model is environment so in an environment we can implement uh the simplest is basically we implement a uh, real world as grid as discrete or grid yeah so we assume it, this one is we can assume this one is a city let's say bandung or jakarta and then we we divide that city into grids and then after that we know that how many people will live in here and so on and so forth so that is a, a simplification of the real world but we, you can get the idea that that is still uh, may work as well right and then if you are interested there are two definitions of neighborhood in uh, in grid environment uh, people from computer science probably know this one very well uh, there is a what we call euclidean neighborhood where the uh, neighbors of a certain agent there are four of them and if you use more neighborhood then it means you have eight neighbors so everybody will have eight neighbors so it's just different definitions of neighborhood yeah. Now, the next one that is more uh, realistic uh, is if we assume that agents will live in our coordinates x, y, z, or x, y, yeah, for two dimensions. So, of course, that will be more uh, accurate than discrete, right? Discrete means you live in a certain grid, grid one, grid two, and so on, so on. But here, you really live in a coordinate, which is definitely more realistic than the previous one, yeah. But, of course, with the realism, you add more complexity, yeah. Then the one that is more complex than that, of course, is GIS. So you can also specify your agents to live in certain location. In this case, we agents, the coordinate is not X, Y anymore. The coordinate will be latitude and longitude because that represents where that person is or that agent is in the real world. Yeah. So it's more realistic now. Uh, of course, it's a bit more challenging to model, but it, again, it's more realistic. And finally, as I said, we can also uh, model networks. Yeah, the networks can be a physical network like telecommunication network, water uh, pipes network, gas pipe networks. Yeah, uh, network can be social, can be uh, something uh, like a social network, can be communication network, friendship network, can be a, a chain of command networks. Yeah, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I have already mentioned to you about assumption and simplifications. 
So assumptions are made when there is a lack of data. So it means that I don't have that data, so let's assume. Uh, so that is assumptions. Simplification is, is nothing to do with data. Simplification is, okay, that thing is too complex to model, to put in the model. Yeah, it takes a, a lot of time to model it. So that's why it, let's simplify it. Yeah. So that is the difference between simplification and assumptions. And bear in mind, all models is a simplification. So just, it, it, so, but there is a right way of simplification and the wrong way of simplifications, <laughs> right? So just to give you an idea about different types of simplification that we can use, uh, let's, let, I have already explained this one, right? Leave things out. So basically you define the model scope, which one we include in the model, which agents should be included, which agents should be excluded. So that is called a leave things out. So that is one of the simplifications that we make, yeah. So remember when I give you examples, if 30% of the agents, they make 70% of the decisions. So maybe we can ignore uh, the 70% of the agents. So just focus on 30% of agents. So exclude the 70% of agents. So that will simplify our model. And then sometimes we can group activities on this. Remember, if, if whether or not we want to implement every single person in Indonesia as an agent, probably not, uh, then maybe we need to group them. So that is one of the simplifications techniques that we can use. Uh, if you're talking about uh, values of a variable, then sometimes we need to uh, define the range of the variable. Instead of considering all possible uh, values, we just focus on certain range because those range uh, of values are the most common in the real world, for example. Instead of, you know, implementing implementing for every eventuality, we focus on the most common scenarios. And uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah, we can also use distribution functions for to represent some uh, the, uh, random numbers. So that is also another simplifications. So uh, we can use that as well. And yeah, a lot of things basically that we can use here. So if something is changing very slowly in the environment, um, so sometimes we assume it as constant, but if something is very fast changing in the environment, so it's very difficult to keep track, then sometimes we just use the average for a certain period and then change again. The next period we change to a certain average again. We can do that one as well. So again, it really depends on uh, the, uh, the context. Okay. okay. Now I think this is the right time for us to take another five minute breaks. Yeah. So uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll just uh, try to answer some of the questions. Then we have a five minute break. Uh, I think I have already answered your question. It's possible to implement uh, a travel behavior. So Puheravati asked a question. Is it possible to implement travel behavior during pandemic? The question is, uh, the answer is of course, yes. Uh, it depends on the objective of the model, of course. What are we going to model here? For example, I've seen a lot of uh, some papers uh, in agent-based model, they try to uh, model the travel behaviors, the airline uh, travel behavior, the air travel behavior, and then try to uh, explain the spread of COVID-19 uh, in the early states uh, from the uh, patterns in the airlines uh, air traffic uh, data. Yeah, so that is possible. So in this case, they model the agents to be uh, uh, where their starting point, uh, the airport, and then where there's a, a endpoint uh, airport, yeah. So, and, and how many people travel following that way. And then we try to uh, simulate the, the spread of the disease. So it is possible. In the city context, you can do the same, right? So if, for example, someone lives in uh, neighborhood A, they move to, uh, they work at in the city center and then go back again. They use, uh, I don't know, uh, MRT in Jakarta, for example, or they use, uh, uh, the bus, for example, and then you can assume, you know, uh, if people, how many people sharing that bus from certain regions, and then you want to simulate the spread of the disease because of that, it is possible. And maybe you can link it, what if some people wear masks properly, some don't wear masks properly. Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, why, why P1 BD? I don't know. <laughs> So this one is saying a fascinating presentation, uh, especially modeling behavior. It would be uh, very interesting if social behavior could be taken into account. 
Too bad we don't have any profiling social demographic like in the Great Britain. Yes, that's correct. Um, the, one of the best things about agent based simulation is the, the fact that we can uh, we can use it for social science simulations where we can really simulate the social uh, in the interactions of people in the society. Uh, that's why we have a special journal for the uh, Journal of Artificial uh, Social Science Simulations. So where you can uh, you can see a lot of applications of so agent-based modeling in social science. And the next comment, the next question is from MTB Bapada. Uh, ba uh, Surya Nikawijaya. Uh, yes, I agree. We can learn how to use the same concept thinking for other wicked problem in development issues. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is from Pa Arif Darana. Uh, I'm trying to understand this. Is it true that we need to quantify the behavior first? Hence, it can be modeled. Uh, very good questions. Um, ideally, yes. Yeah, because then your model will be more accurate. It's easier to defend because then because you can quantify uh, the behavior by collecting some data. But even if you can't, then you can state this one assumptions, for example. Yeah, ideally, again, if you can't find the data, use uh, existing theory because there are so a lot of theories management theories uh, social science uh, sociology theory uh, psychological uh, psych psychology theory for example that can be used uh, safe uh, in management we typically use uh, theory of plant behavior for example for agent based model we can also use the transactional uh, cost economics for uh, agent, the structure of agents. So if you don't, if you can't collect the data, empirical data, then you can use existing theory and use assumptions on the, on the parameters. But of course your, uh, your, uh, your, your conclusion will be not as strong as if you're using um, empirical, sorry, empirical data. But again, uh, maybe that is the best we can, use, uh, can do and your solution can be as quite as, as good. Because maybe what you are more what is more important for us, because we are talking about social issue here, is the qualitative behavior rather than oh, it will be one hundred people will be infected in day one uh, or in day one hundred. No, sometimes we are not interested in the exact number, but we just want to know what is the pattern here. Will will it increase and then collapse at some point or what? So sometimes it's more important to us is just the qualitative behavior, correct? So in that case, yeah, it's uh, it's fine. I hope that explain uh, answer your questions, Parif. Yeah, and then there's a Pak Ebet from BPPD uh, Jabar. Uh, sure, it can. UK has a demographic profile which characterizes UK social structure for business and service planning purposes. Yes, correct, Pak Ebet. Thank you. Um, and then finally, before break, Pak Zaka Uki Rizki. Uh, if I use a single organization as an agent and learn its interaction with others, does it mean that ABMS will be similar with system dynamics simulations? Because in this case, we model a macro subject rather than a micro uh, behavior. Mm, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So the unit will be the organizations. Yeah, I think the answer is yes, uh, because uh, the, what makes me thinking is that um, if you just model one agent in just one single agent, yeah, not one agent type, please differentiate this one. I can simulate one agent type called farmer, but in my model, there will be 1,000 farmers. Now, that is a valid uh, agent-based model. But if you build a model with just one agent, one farmer, for example, or one organization, then it's not an agent-based model because you you don't have to interact with yourself, right? So you will interact with yourself, no interaction with other people, uh, with other agents. In that case, uh, uh, you are losing the power of agent-based simulations because agent-based simulation is about simulating the interaction between agents, whether or not that can explain the behavior at the system level. So because we only have one agent, exactly one agent, so the system level, and the individual behavior will be exactly the same thing. Huh? So there is no point of using agent-based model. 
So you're right in that case. Uh, whether or not this can be considered a uh, system dynamics, it depends on what you model inside. Yeah, so maybe uh, that is uh, my uh, quick answer because I don't want to explain what system dynamics is. So maybe uh, that will be for the next discussion, but that is my answer. Okay, so the next comment from Ari Danana. Yes, correct, Ari. So that's why that will be the, the topic of my next sessions. So after the break. So in that case, then let's take a, take a five minute breaks. Now my time is 10 minutes past. So let's meet in at 15 minutes past. Yeah, let's take a five minute break. We start at exactly 15 minutes past the hour. Okay, thank you. So see you in five minutes. Welcome back everyone. So in the next session, we are going to do a bit more practical, yeah. So I have already given you uh, two links. One is to Google Collab, and the other one is to uh, Binder. So you can use any of them, yeah, it's exactly the same thing, but in two different systems. Yeah, just in case one is down today. So at least we hopefully the other one is working. If put are down, then we are in a very bad luck. <laughs> so uh, you can choose any of them, see which one is working. Yeah, doesn't matter which one. So we are going to use that code. Okay. So before I'm going, uh, before I uh, we do a practical sessions, uh, I'm going to explain to you uh, uh, about the tool itself, Agent Pi. Yeah. As you may know, Agent Pi is only one of the tools are uh, used in agent-based modeling. Um, it's in fact, it's the, the, the latest probably, it's the newest, yeah. So other tools uh, include NetLogo and AnyLogic and Repass. I think those, those three are uh, the most uh, widely known worldwide. Um, I quite like agent Pi because uh, I can combine it with any other Python code. So if you are into Pythons, then agent Pi is probably be your uh, your choice. Okay, so this tutorial will be based on a paper that will be available uh, publicly, but unfortunately, it's not now. It will be available uh, by end of this year, by December. Yeah. So uh, so uh, uh, be patient. You will get it <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Uh, just Google it. So. Uh, Okay, so without further ado, uh, so this uh, agent part is written by Joel uh, for our meeting. Uh, so we have written a paper together to, for the tutorial. Okay, okay. so agent part, basically what is agent part? Agent part supports um, creation of custom agent and model types, which is very common for all agent-based model modeling tool. If it doesn't do this, then it's not an agent-based modeling tool, right? Uh, the, uh, but, Agent Pi supports interactive simulation using a Python. Yeah. So in this case, you need to use Jupyter Notebook. Um, so for interactive simulation. So interactive simulation is where you can really see how the simulation runs. The one that I showed you earlier uh, with the city example. So that is I'm using interactive simulations. So in Jupyter Notebook. So then you can really see how the, the ghettos uh, are formed. And then we can also use simulation over uh, multiple runs, which is quite important for simulations. And it can be used for uh, the analysis of simulation output as well. And the good thing about Agent Pi is compatible with a popular Python library like Network X, NumPy, Pandas. So those who have used uh, uh, Python probably knows most of these uh, libraries. Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, next. So uh, when you want to model, uh, agent based model using uh, agent pi. The concept is this. So in agent pi, you can you need to define the agents, which is the origins part. Yeah. Now these agents live in environments. So the green part, the green box. So you need to define environment as well. Yeah. And these environments uh, resides inside a model. So you need to define a model. So in a way, agents also is inside the model, yeah. Now, this by itself is already a simulation model. If you can run it, yeah, using single run, and that is a simulation model, yeah. But of course, you can also define an experiment that control the model so that you can use, uh, you can do multiple run, yeah, using the model. 
Now, regardless whether you run it once or multiple times, uh, it will produce output data. Uh, the output data will be in Panda's uh, dictionary form. So in this case, it's, it's up to this point, if you know how to use Panda, then it's easy for you to do the analysis yourself yeah, using any tools that you, you are familiar with. Okay, so that is the structure of Agent Pi. So let me repeat. If you want to build an agent pi, uh, agent based model using agent pi, you need to define the agents, environment, and model. That is the very least. And then you can also implement, uh, use, uh, implement the experiments. These two will be generated. Uh, this purple output data will be generated automatically, of course, when you run the simulations. Yeah. So then you can do, you can use whatever tools that you are familiar with um, for the analysis and visualizations. Okay, so we are, I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, in fact, you will do it yourself. Yeah, okay, let's start. How do I uh, define agents in agent pi? Uh, it's quite simple, yeah. So you, all that you need to do is to define a class for your agent type. Yeah, so my agent here is agent type. Yeah, so please uh, differentiate between agent type and agents, yeah. So you can, you can write a simulation model, a nature-based model with one agent type. Yeah, agent type is like a blueprint, right? So when you run the simulations, you can create multiple agents from the same agent type, just like you can create multiple cars from one blueprint of a car. They will be exactly the same kind of car, but maybe with different colors. Yeah, it's the same as in here. Uh, they may be, they will be exactly the same type of agents, but maybe they have different height, different weight, different, I don't know, color, different, whatever. Yeah, different proper properties. So that is a uh, agent type. So how do you, uh, so my agent here is agent type. So in this case, we haven't created any agent yet. We only define what our agent is. So inside here, yeah, so this is definitely because you want to uh, inherit from the uh, uh, agent pi, AP is agent pi. Yeah, it's, this is type of agent. This is how we Python knows that you are defining an agent, basically. So the, then dev setup, this is uh, provided, uh, this is a keyword. Yeah, so you need to uh, override this one. You need to define what should we do when we create an agent later on. So this is where you define steps that will be executed when an agent is created. So typically, this is where we set up our, the attributes of the agents typically. Yeah, but of course you can do uh, any other things as well. But typically this is to set up the attributes of the agents. Uh, attributes here, uh, the characteristics of the agents, say like the height, the width, uh, the wealth, uh, the health, and so on and so forth, yeah. And then this is where you can put in your own, uh, uh, definitions. So typically we want to define, uh, we want to model behaviors, right? Behaviors of agents. So this is behavior one called agent method. Yeah. So you can, you need to rename it to something else. Say for example, the behavior, the first behavior that I want to uh, model is called purchase. When uh, an agent purchase a product. So in this case, I type def, which is a keyword and then followed by the name of the behavior. So in this case, I'll just put purchase. So I can change this one to purchase. And then you can just write down your code in here. Uh, if you want the, uh, the model second behavior of the agent, so it just doesn't only purchase, but do something else, say for example, spread the world or tell others, then you type in dev tell others. Yeah, so that is your second behavior and so on and so forth. You can implement any uh, as many behaviors as you like. But remember when I explained earlier, focus on key behaviors only. Yeah. Okay, I hope that's clear. So that's how you define uh, an agent type. Now, once you define the agent type, so in this case, let's, um, in this case then, uh, how do we define a model? So in this case, we, 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 we don't have any environment. So we don't define environment. Remember, environment is optional. So this is a simplest model first. So uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, how do we uh, set up the, um, Hang on a second. Oh yeah. So this is how we uh, specify the model. So again, in order to uh, Python to know that you are specifying model, you have to inherit it from 
agent by dot model. So this is a, a must, but the name my model, of course you can change it to any name you like. Yeah. So you can change it to, I don't know, um, the COVID-19 model or transportation model and so on and so forth. Yeah. And these four, um, uh, these four functions, they have to, uh, they are keywords. So you have to implement them. Yeah. If, if, when you need it. So for example, dev setup is where if when you create the model is initialized, what should we do inside? Typically, when the model is set up, we will create the agents. Now, this is where we create agents from agent type my agent. So my agent here is an agent type. So here the command basically uh, create an agents. Yeah. So self dot agents equal to ap dot agent list. This is basically create an agents uh, from the type of my agents, and then how many of them? This eight. the number of agents that we created is put in the second parameter here. Self dot p dot agents is the number of agents. So you can put one hundred, for example, to create one hundred agents from the same type my agent. So this is where we included, and those each agents will be stored in this list agents uh, list. Yeah, so that is the, the meaning of this command. And then step, basically, this is the, this is the key, uh, this, is the, this method, this function, will be called every time step. Every time step, this will be executed. Yeah, so every time click, uh, this will be executed by uh, agent pi. So in this case, uh, all, then it's up to you what to do. So in this case, it simply is to call all agents do agent method. Yeah, so in this case, this is this function from agent earlier will be called. So this age, so for all agents, call agent method. So this is basically what happened in here. Yeah. Now, update is typically used when we want to record uh, something for analysis. Yeah. So in this case, I will record, uh, we instruct all agents to record one of their variables. Yeah, the one that we want to uh, observe. So this can be, uh, if it is COVID-19, we want the agents to record their status, whether they are now infectious, whether they are um, recovered, or they, whether they are susceptible, for example. Yeah, so then we can count the number of people, susceptible, and so on and so forth, okay? Right, so that is update. But update can also be used uh, for synchronization. So for example, if, I say, imagine the, the city example. If I want to make decisions, I'm not happy, for example, because my neighbors, uh, they are not what I want. I'm not happy, I'm going to move somewhere else. Now, when we implement that in agent by, we only set at the step level, at the step, we only set that I'm going to move, but I'm not moving yet. Why? Because if I move, then I will change my neighborhood, right? Now, it means that the other agents will be affected by me. So there is a synchronization issue here. So ideally, what we want to do is that everybody will commit first. Okay, I want to move. So apply this one to all agents in the city. And then at the update, which will be executed after step, all agents will say, okay, if you are committed to move, then you move now. But the decision to move will be based on the same state. Yeah, because I remember the earlier states, uh, the, all agents hasn't moved yet. They only commit to move, but they haven't really moved. So physically, they were still located at the same locations. So in that case, then the decisions will be fair because everybody will make decisions based on the same state, same uh, uh, situations in the city. Yeah. So that is what we call synchronizations. Yeah. And then N is this is the one that will be executed at the end. So this is where, so basically N and setup will be executed once when you run simulations, but step and update will be executed every time. Yeah, every time step. So every time step, step will be executed first, followed by update. And then time two, again, step again will be executed, update will be executed. So there's step and update will be executed every time. Yeah, I hope that is clear. And then update is also executed uh, after setup as well. So whenever setup is called in the beginning, then immediately an update will be called as well. So that is also that is the uh, for update. Yeah. 
Okay, so that is basically uh, uh, how we specify model and agent part. Okay, now let's have a look at this example, uh, wealth transfer example, which is the, uh, from the tutorial, yeah, from agent part tutorial. This is a simple example about for every agent will have wealth. Yeah, so a variable called wealth. And then every agent at random will choose another agent and then they give the money to the other agents without question ask, just give the money. Yeah. Of course, only if the agent has money, right? If it doesn't have money, there's nothing to give. Now, in this kind of simple communities, uh, simple populations, what do you think will, will, will happen in the, at the society level in terms of wealth distributions? So initially, all agents will have the same uh, wealth. They are all homogeneous. They have one unit money. Yeah, they have one, say, dollar or one rupiah. They have one dollar each. So everybody is the same. But after you run it multiple times, uh, sorry, after you run it for several time steps, what do you think will happen? All that they do is simply pick someone at random and give the money. Give one unit of money. Now, this is, I hope, AX shows you, right? The behavior is very simple. You give someone at random and then give the money if you have it. Now, but we as a human sometimes quite difficult to think, so what will happen in the system level? So this is where agent-based simulation can be useful. It's kind of a thought process, a thought experiment, right? So what happened? So why not just implement it? Yeah, so in this case then, we basically the implementation is very easy here. So for wealth agents, so again, we, this is the agent type, yeah? Of course, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, Python, uh, initially uh, you will import all the library that you need, right? In this case, I need to import agent pi because that is the tool, uh, the software that I'm going to use, right? Agent pi. So that's why you need to import agent pi. Uh, the alias is AP. We need to uh, import numpy because we will use the random number from numpy later on. We call it NP here, the alias. And then we will use seaborn because we want to uh, plot something using seaborn later on. Um, but if you look at how we define the, the agent here, wealth agents, at the initials, uh, when you create the agent at the initializations, or if you know about object oriented programming, this is at the constructor. So this is the constructor in, uh, in object oriented programming. You simply say, okay, your wealth is one. So all agents will have one unit of wealth. So this is to create a homogeneous society. Yeah. Now the behavior, the next behavior is called wealth transfer. So wealth transfer basically is saying that if my wealth is greater than zero, then I will pick a partner at random and then I will increase that partner wealth by one and I reduce myself with one. Simple, right? Grab someone at random, give one unit of my wealth to that person, and that's it. So that is the behavior of each agent later on. Now let's define the model now. The model, when we initialize the model, then all we do here is, is, is quite standard. We create all create agents, a number of agents from wealth agent type, and then put everything in the list of agents. Now for every time step, what we do is, is we call wealth transfer. Remember wealth transfer is the one that we defined earlier. It's basically each agent will grab someone at random and then transfer the money if they have one. Okay. So this is basically saying that all agents please execute wealth transfer. Now at update, we will record the Gini coefficient in the populations. Yeah, I will explain what Gini coefficient is later. But basically, we are every time step we will record the Gini coefficient of the agents. Okay. And then at the end of the simulations, we will record the wealth accumulated by each agent. So this is where we want to know the uh, wealth distributions of the agents. So we, every agent will report how much is your money now. Last time we start with one for every individual. What happens at the end? Will they still have one on average for every agent or, or not? 
Uh, just to give you the uh, what Gini index is. Gini index is typically uh, something that we use uh, to measure um, the gap, uh, the uh, what is it called, the the homogeneity uh, in a society. Yeah. So typically, in terms of wealth, we are want to know which one has the 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 widest gap between rich and the poor. Yeah. So that is called Gini index. So the Gini index of closer than uh, 100, it means the gap is really high, 100% or one, yeah. If it is closer to zero, it means a really equal society, yeah. So uh, you can see here uh, from the color, the, 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 the more red the color is, the higher the disparity is between people in that region, okay? So just to give you an idea what Gini index is, yeah. So I'm not going to explain to you how to, ex uh, uh, you can always Google this one, what it means by this command, yeah. There is a NumPy command, so it's something that you can learn later, okay. So in this case, the parameter we set, okay, the number of agents is 100, number of steps is 100, so we will run it from 100 steps. And SID is basically the random number generator. We start with 42, so it means that we can repeat it again later using 42. If you choose different random SID number, you will produce this different results. Remember in simulations, we need to run it multiple times, and then every time you need to change the SID number. So then you can produce a number of different results, and then you take the average to calculate the expected value. Yeah. Now for those who are familiar with Python, but if you're not familiar, it's okay because I give you a clue here where to look at. So the result of once you run this model, this is how you uh, this is how you set up the model. Yeah. So wealth model set with the parameters. So pass on the parameters here, and this will set the model. Yeah. Remember th this previous step is to define the model. So this is to how to define the model but we haven't created the model yet. So we only define the model. In this model definition, we have created the agents. This is to create the agents. But in this previous step, we only define the agents. We haven't created the agents. I hope you see the pattern here, right? We define the agents, but we define the model, and this is where we created the agents. But the model is still defined, not created. So in this, the next step is this is where we create the model. So now the model is created. Now because model has created, then we can run the model by clicking, by typing model.run. And then the result will be stored in results. Yeah. So when, the, so when we run it, this will produce what we call data dictionary uh, in, in Panda. Yeah, so because remember we asked the, uh, we ask the model to uh, to record two different uh, model uh, two different outputs. The first one is to record the Gini coefficients every time step, and to record wealth at the end just once. Remember, we record two things, so that's why it will have two things here. Yeah. So this is the one that is recorded by each agent every at every. Um, this is the one that is. Uh, this is the one that is uh, recorded by agents at the end. Yeah, that's why it has 100 data. Web model is the one that is recorded every time step. So that's why it has 101 data. Remember that includes time zero, where the uh, where setup is called. Remember update is called every after setup and every time step. So there are 100 time steps. So it means 100 updates plus one update from the setup. So that's why we have 101 data. So if you plot this wealth uh, model, the one that you get will be something like this. So this is basically 100 time steps, one simulation run. Yeah. So you can see the, uh, the Gini index. 